Good afternoon. Three o'clock on a Monday, UK time. Well, it must be time for Joe and Mike's award-winning virtual tours. We say award because, yes, we won a European title. I cannot remember the last time that Scotland has ever won a European title, so we're going to take that. We got it from the G Guide Academy for Sustainable Guiding. And we'd like to thank everybody who's been watching us because it's only through your support and through your constant support that we get, we're getting recognised. And I'd like to say thank you very, very much indeed. And when, when the award arrives, we'll certainly show you as well. And I'm standing here in St Cuthbert's Churchyard. St Cuthbert's Churchyard is at the bottom of Lothian Road. I know some of you are watching it on Google Maps. So if you're looking at the bottom of Lothian Road, where it meets Princess Street, you'll see St Cuthbert's Churchyard. Now, to begin with, as always, we'd like to say a little shout out and a little thank you. Um, I'd like to say konnichiwa and origato to our friends in Japan. And I'd like to say buongiorno to our friends in Italy. Some people say it lights up the day in Italy, so molto grazie for that. Also, buenos dias to our friends in Spain and in South America. And guten tag, bonjour to everybody else in Europe and hello to North America and South America. I'd also like to say a special call out to Tunis Baker who lives in Poughkeepsie in New York and Diane Viscio who lives in Poughkeepsie, New York. Do you two know each other? But let's say thank you, thank you very much. When I was living in the States, I used to listen to a radio station from Poughkeepsie. Maybe you know it. They used to play great music. I used to pick it up when I was living in New Jersey. I'd also like to say to hello to Pamela and Pamela Longville in Duluth, Minnesota. Hi, Pamela. And we've got our friends across in the west of Scotland here, Caroline Moynes. Hi, Caroline. How are you doing? It's uh, Joe here. Um, all the way from Glasgow. Hi, Glasgow. Or hiya. And we've got Leslie Milne even a little bit further west over in Ardrossan in North Ayrshire. Hi, Leslie. I'm glad you're tuning in. It's really nice to get even local support here in Scotland as well. And even further west, over in Toronto, we've got Janet Reuter. Hi, Janet. How are you doing? I'm so pleased you can all join us again. As I mentioned, we're here in St. Cuthbert's Churchyard. Now, St. Cuthbert was a, a, one of the early Christian Scottish saints. He actually originates from a little bit further south here in the Peebles area. Um, however, the tradition says that he actually had a church here, going back to the 6th century, a church on this site here. We can't verify that, but what we can verify is that St. Cuthbert's has been a holy ground since the 13th century, so about the 12th century, 1200s, 13th, uh, 13th century. So this has been a holy ground for a very, very long time. Um, St. Cuthbert's is a Church of Scotland, so it's part of the Kirk. Um, the current church actually was established in the late 1700s, I think 1774 to be exact, so just a little bit before the American Revolution. And uh, began to be populated by some famous people. We're going to point out quite a few, well, one or two of the famous people who are buried in here, in this churchyard. Some of you, you may recognise straight away, and some of you might actually put a little light bulb up in your brain as well when we talk about them. The first one I want to talk about is a chap here called Alexander Naismith. And this is his wonderful Celtic cross monument here. Now he was born in 1758, died in 1840. So he was at the cusp of the 1700s going over to the 1800s. Now, if you've been watching us, you will, have, you will have heard us talk about the Scottish Enlightenment. This is the heart of the Scottish Enlightenment. Now, Alexander Naismith was born into quite humble circumstances. And he was apprenticed to a, a carriage maker. So he was uh, put in, when they were all going around with the car, horses and carts and carriages, he was employed to paint the doors of these carriages to make them more ornate. His talents were recognised very early and, and, uh, and then they were developed and he became quite a well-known artist. Um, he also was contemporary with Robert Burns and if you were with us last week um, when we did the tour of Dean Village, you would have hear, heard us mention Thomas Telford who built the bridge. So he was also a contemporary of Thomas Telford and he actually worked with Thomas Telford to design the bridge. Earlier on last week in the last tour of Dean Village, we started off at St. Bernard's Well. And you saw the well with a beautiful Greek, uh, classical Greek statue there of Hygiena. I'm going to say Hygiena. And uh, he actually designed that monument at the well. 
However, he's probably better known uh, for his relationship with Robert Burns. I'm sure you're all familiar with Robert Burns. If you are not familiar with Robert Burns, then you should be familiar with Robert Burns. If you live in an English-speaking country, every New Year you'll be celebrating New Year and you'll sing the song Old Lang Syne. Robert Burns wrote the song Old Lang Syne. And Alexander Naismith's, one of his most famous poetry, is of Robert Burns. And I've got the picture. The picture actually is is in the National Galleries of Scotland and we've pointed them out before but when you come to Edinburgh please please visit the National Galleries of Scotland. The National Galleries are free of charge and it's a great place to visit and I'll let you into a little secret. The National Galleries of Scotland have got the best toilets on Princess Street so you've got absolutely no excuse not to visit them. Free of charge, great toilets, great cafe and great portraits and here's the portrait of the famous Robert Burns. Isn't he a handsome chap? That's by Alexander Naismith. Now remember, so he was born in 1758. This church that we're going, to, we're going to see a little bit later on wasn't built until the late 1700s. So he'd have seen this church being built as well. But he was also contemporary with some other people that we're going to talk about as we walk along through the cemetery here. Now, we're t I was talking to my Carolyn and I said, it's a bit ironic, we're talking about bringing history to life in Edinburgh and we're always in graveyards bringing out people. The irony is not lost in us as well. But the good thing about this churchyard, and we love it, is that it's just directly under Edinburgh Castle and you'll get a good view of the Edinburgh Castle as we walk through the cemetery as well. Lots of people love to come and visit here. Very, very popular. It backs onto Princess Street Gardens. So when you're here, you can easily get access to the Princess Street Gardens. Now the next person I'm going to talk about is also a contemporary of Alexander Naismith. And he was also a contemporary of Sir Walter Scott. So we've got this overlap of these people. So Walter Scott also knew Robert Burns. Alexander Naismith knew Robert Burns. He also would have known of Walter Scott's writing. Being in this period of the late 1700s, early 1800s, they would have seen the development of the Edinburgh New Town. So they'd be here when the atmosphere would have been bustling. The new ideas were all coming at the city and they were part of it. It was often said if you're walking through Edinburgh at the end of the 1700s, you'd be rubbing shoulders with giants. Because these men were great at the time. They were way ahead of the rest of the communities in terms of the rest of Great Britain in many, many respects. Because a lot of the inventions were coming out of the small city, the powerhouse that it was, the Edinburgh Enlightenment or the Scottish Enlightenment. So let's take you on to another character I want to talk about. And he's sharing the same cemetery as Alexander Naismith. Now the name might not mean much to you to begin with, but his name is George Meikle Kemp. Now George Meikle Kemp, again, contemporary of Sir Walter Scott, actually designed and built the Scott Monument. If you've been to Edinburgh before, you will notice, you'll have noticed the Scott Monument. It's a Gothic monument in the middle of Princess Street. And George Meikle Kemp here. And if you haven't seen the Scott Monument. I have a photograph or a print of the Scott Monument here. If you like Gothic architect architecture, then Edinburgh is a place to come. Edinburgh gives good Gothic. Now, poor Mr. George Michael Kemp. Bit of a sad story. Um, great architect of his time. Um, got the contract for the design of the Scott Monument. The stone for the Scott Monument was coming into Edinburgh through or via a canal. One evening, George went to visit the contractor who was contracted to actually bring the stone into the city. Went up to the canal, met with the contractor, did the business that was there. And when he came out, apparently it was a foggy evening and uh, he disappeared. It wasn't until about a week later that his body was found actually in the canal. And it was found because he had the habit of tying his hat with a cord and tying it to his coat. 
And it was only a few, a, a few days after he had disappeared that his hat actually came to the top of the icy waters of the canal. And so his body was found. Now, as with every good story of George Michael Kemp, the conspiracy started to unravel. Was he pushed? Was he drunk? I guess we'll never know. But George Michael Kemp, again, renowned for the design and building of the Scott Monument. And while we're here, you can get one of the best views you'll see here of Edinburgh Castle. And Mike can take that in there. Beautiful. One of the lesser known aspects. So you've got to come into St Cuthbert's Churchyard and have a good view of Edinburgh Castle. The churchyard is open every day, so it's free access. You can come in any time you wish. There's no charges. You can come in all open. So let's move around the churchyard a little bit. We'll get a view of the church itself. And we'll talk about some of the other, one other famous person that was that's buried here. Again, another contemporary of George Kemp and Alexander Neesmith. Now have a look at the colours. It's autumn here, as you can guess. The colours are all changing. You're going to see the beautiful reds and yellows of the trees. We just come, actually, this weekend we just had a quite a major storm. Not so much, not so windy here, but we had a lot of rain here over the weekend. And we'll make our way through the churchyard. Have a look at the spire itself. So the church is part of the Church of Scotland. So it's part of the kirk, as you've had, heard us mention before. Now, what I always find interesting is that the people who are buried here would have seen this church being built. So this would have been a new church to them. Now, St Cuthbert's Church was outside of the city <coughs> itself. And being outside of the city, it was a big target for the resurrectionists. We've talked about the resurrectionists before, the body stealers. It was a good industry. The students at the university needed more cadavers. Where's the best place to get your cadavers? from the cemetery. So you keep an eye open on the Scotsman newspaper and you look at the hatches, matches and dispatches as we call it and you find out who had died recently and where they were going to be buried and you would probably state your claim on the grave itself, making sure that the corpse was as fresh as it could be for dissection up at Edinburgh University Medical School. Now another famous person who's actually buried here, but we can't find his grave, but he has got a monument, but it's inside the church, and unfortunately the church is closed at the moment, is John Napier. For those of you who studied maths, or anything to do with maths or sciences, or even architecture, or any of the design, may remember logarithms, having to learn logarithms. Well, it was indeed John Napier uh, who invented logarithms. Had it not been for John Napier inventing logarithms, we wouldn't have got the bridges, so engineering would have started. So again, we've got these great people who are all buried here in this little graveyard. And then you can have a look at the church here. And the clock face says, or the sundial says 1774, but further up it says 1780. So you can see where it was actually built in stages. And I always find it amazing, I've said before, that Alexander Naismith, George Michael Kemp, and our next character who we're going to talk about, all would have seen this church being built. And would have seen the new town of Edinburgh being built as well. Have a look at some of these gravestones, here's Mike showing you here, they get the skull and crossbones. This is the Memento Mori, this is just to tell you that unto dust we shall return. Another writer, Archibald Meggett, 1778. 
I just wanted to show Mike this tree here. It's one of my favorite trees here. We call it the monkey puzzle tree. I just love them. It's actually from South America. It grows very well here in Scotland. The monkey puzzle. I think the Latin name is Arucaria. Arucaria. Let's go back to my old botany days when I studied a little bit of botany at Edinburgh University. Comes from the Andes or South America. Grows extremely well here in Scotland. A tree that children never climb. It take the skin off you. <laughs> So let's take a little bit wander around here. Take you past some of these tombs here that are pretty dangerous. I would not walk in there uh, given the opportunity. But I'm going to take you to another famous character. I don't know if any of you have studied any English literature. Um, you may have studied the Lakeland Poets. When you talk about the Lakeland Poets, you think of Wordsworth and Coleridge. But you also think of Thomas de Quincey. So I'm going to take you to the grave of Thomas de Quincey. Some of you may have been on tours around Britain before. Um, there's a company that I have worked with in the past called Odysseys Unlimited. They're a Boston-based based company. And they do these wonderful round Britain tours. And one of the themes that I like to pick up throughout the whole tour is, is literature. Because we start off in Edinburgh, but we do stop off in the Lake District and we do go to Wordsworth's cottage and house and we go to the grammar school that Wordsworth actually was taught in. So I like to make the links as we go through and the tour itself takes in Shakespeare country so also also goes to Stratford, goes to Bath so we talk about Jane Austen and then ends up in London so we talk about Dickens and then London authors. So Thomas de Quincey well, you could say that Thomas de Quincey was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Indeed. He came from a... Uh, his father was a wealthy merchant. Didn't want for much. This is born in near Manchester. His father died when he was quite young, and his mother sent him down to Bath to be educated in Bath. You have to say Bath, not Bath. You have a bath in Bath. And... Um, so he's very well educated down in, down in Bath and then was sent back up to Manchester to join the Manchester Grammar School. Bit of money behind him. However, as with the, lots of the rich dilettantes of their day, um, he did get into a lot of debt. He, did not, he, went, he, he was supposed to go to university straight away, but he didn't go to university. He ended up being a bit of a, a wayfarer and he would earn his money because he was a good writer, he's very well educated. He would sell his services as a writer. And he went on a tour of Wales. When I said he went on a tour of Wales, he was actually paid by his uncle to keep away from the family for some reason. And I'm going to delve in a little bit more about that myself. However, he did start to read more about Wordsworth and he was intrigued by Wordsworth and Coleridge and by the, the, the poets from the Lakeland. And they were all contemporaries of Walter Scott as well. They all knew each other. They all used to criticise each other in the literary magazines. Coleridge made his way up to the Lakeland uh, area and actually stayed with uh, in, in, the, in uh, the, same, the same house as the Lakeland poets themselves. However, De, De Quincey had a bit of an issue. He had neuralgia in his jaw. And in the habit of those days, he would actually take his laudanum. Then he got a bit too partial to the laudanum had to take a lot more and it actually became an opium junkie and one of his famous books is the confessions of an English opium eater he moved to Edinburgh and he moved, in, moved up to Edinburgh because there was a, a, mag, a magazine editor up here that he got in, in, in league with however he came up with a bit of debt with him and he was chased for his debts and if you remember a few weeks ago we did uh, one of our tours down at Holyrood Palace and at Holyrood Palace, we did show you the sanctuary where if you've been chased for your debts, you could take sanctuary in Sanctuary House and they couldn't catch you. And you could come out on Sundays because you couldn't be chased for your debts on a Sunday. Well, De Quincey was one of the people who actually lived in Sanctuary House. And he even while he was in Sanctuary House, he ratcheted up even more debt. However, when his mother died, he did inherit money from his mother, so he had an annual stipend. And he had quite a few children as well. And his daughters took over the handling of the house, housekeeping, basically. 
but he's famous for his relationship with all of the Lakeland poets and he's always mentioned with them he was an essayist however on the other side of it he came from a very wealthy family he was against emancipation of the working classes he was against universal suffrage suffrage so I think De Quincey and I would have been on opposite sides of the aisle if you see what I mean in many regards so again died in 1837 born in the 1700s so we got De Quincey Naismith Kemp we got Robert Burns we got Walter Scott we've got over in Glasgow we've got James Watt James Watt was was developing the steam engine or the steam power over there so they would have seen all the development this was when the Industrial Revolution was starting and it started here and if you were with us last week when we did the Dean Village we talked about all the water mills all down the river they would have seen those water mills close and move further down to the to the shore down to Leith because steam was coming into its own as well so they would have actually seen the building of these much larger what they call dark satanic mills so that's the story of Thomas de Quincey buried here in Edinburgh but the one thing I want to show you and this is one that I get really touched right next to Thomas de Quincey as a little plaque here a little stone here dedicated to Rufus Woodward he was born in Connecticut in 1793 and graduated from Yale in 1816 so even then coming from the States coming from Yale he keeps coming over to Edinburgh because I guess they knew that things were happening here and he came over here to visit Europe to pursue his studies and to restore his health he came to Edinburgh to restore his health how bad was it in Torringford Connecticut they had to come to Edinburgh for his health however he died here and he must and I feel really sorry for him because it says here that his friends were here who cheered him in his last hours and committed his remains to this grave they knew and recognized him as the amiable American stranger now I think that is lovely right next to his contemporary here De Quincey and it's highly likely if he was at the university here he would have known De Quincey he'd have known Walter Scott they would have all known each other and they would have been part of this boom that was happening here at the end of the 1700s beginning of the 1800s so hopefully we're all pulling things together all these little tours that we're doing we're all pulling it together to get an idea of what was happening here at Edinburgh in Edinburgh let's move around a little bit further we'll move out of the cemetery a few little more snippets I want to give you here though I did talk about the resurrectionists this would have been a popular burial place as I mentioned it had been a relatively new cemetery at the time um, outside the city walls a little bit far from the city itself in terms of in those days right now it's in the middle of the city because of the city also came out and encroached upon it and this was a great target for the resurrectionists you can almost imagine coming through coming down here on a foggy evening in autumn and winter when it gets dark quite early and the fog is all swirling about you and there's a new grave that's been dug and you get these people who are just waiting to climb over the walls of the cemetery to get the riches that were buried in there so they could take the body and take it up to the university however to prevent that some people were buried in graves with fences metal fences to prevent them some people were buried with the slabs on top of the graves some people were built in mort lakes so lock and key but one of the things they did do also was they employed people to look after the cemeteries sextons and this particular cemetery the sexton lived in a watchtower and so we have this lovely little watchtower here and this is where the sexton would live and they would be guarding and looking out for the resurrectionists to prevent them taking the bodies up to Edinburgh University it's a lovely little place there it's still occupied you can see the light on inside and then just behind that you can see this wonderful red sandstone building we're going to talk about that in a little little bit later 
But before we leave this wonderful little churchyard here, I don't know if we get anybody here who loves the detective stories or loves the sleuthing. Well, this is the church where Agatha Christie had her second marriage. Agatha Christie went up to the Isle of Skye for a month before her marriage. The bans of marriage were read in secret. And her second marriage took place here in St Cuthbert's Churchyard in the Church of Scotland. The reason it could take place here is that she could not get married again in the Church of England because they didn't allow divorcees to get married again, but the Church of Scotland did allow it. Um, same happened with Princess Anne. Princess Anne had a second marriage up here in Scotland because she couldn't get married in the, remarried in the Church of England. So let's take a step out. We're going on to the, the main street here on Lothian Road. We're going to leave the churchyard behind. Highly recommend a little visit here. And I told you last week about the story of Fern, and Fern sent me a little email. She's thanking me, thanking me very much for the story. And I know some of you actually really like the story of Fern as well. So, so pleased you all like that little story. Just going to wait until this little crowd of guys go by. So the universities are all back here, and the schools are coming out now. So all the universities are back. And we'll just take the safe way over the main road. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Caledonian Hotel. This beautiful red sandstone building. Now we know, when we look at the building itself, we know that this was built after the beginning of the railways. In fact, it was actually built as a railway hotel. Red sandstone is not natural to this local area. It comes from a quarry, which is in the southwest of Scotland. And so the stone was imported to Edinburgh. When you go to Glasgow, you see a lot of the buildings are made of the red sandstone, which is common to that area. Here, the sandstone is blonde. And you've seen that when we were in the new town of Edinburgh. And you've seen it when we showed you the National Galleries and the neoclassical buildings. But this is red sandstone. Caledon Hotel was opened in 1903. When they started to develop the railways here in the UK, we had the railways coming up from London up to Scotland, and there was competition between the various railway companies. They were all separate companies, all competing with each other. And one of the railways was the Caledonian Railway Company. And at the end of your journey, you'd want somewhere nice to stay. So at the end of the journey, they would build these beautiful hotels. We've already mentioned the Balmoral Hotel. And the Balmoral Hotel was also a railway hotel, built for a competing railway company. Let's take a little walk along to the front of the hotel. The hotel itself has played host to many, many famous people, and I'll mention a few of them as we walk on. Now, right next to St. Cuthbert's Church, we have St. John's Church. So, St. Cuthbert Church is the Church of Scotland. And St. John's Church is the Church of England. Again, have a look at the architecture. We'll get a good view of the two both churches together. You'll see both steeples of the churches. And right through, you'll get a picture of Edinburgh Castle as well. St. John's has its own churchyard as well. And maybe we will pay a visit a little later today into St. John's. So we've got the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. Again, the difference is being the Church of Scotland, Presbyterian Church, has no hierarchy. Church of England, or Episcopal Church, part of the Anglican community, has the hierarchy of archbishops, bishops, priests, and also has the Queen as the head 
of the Church of England. Church of Scotland, no head as such, quite a democratic structure, so quite different in their approaches to hierarchies within the community. Now a little shower is just starting here so I'm going to get my umbrella up and we'll walk over here and we'll give you a good picture or view of the Caledonian Hotel. Known familiarly here in Edinburgh or affectionately known as the Cali. It's now part of the Waldorf Astoria group. Opened in 1903. Five star accommodation. Wonderful place to go and stay in there. I think a few people, if you've been on any tours with uh, Mike or I, you may have been actually involved, uh, been here and stayed here. Very, very popular. And it has played host to some very famous people. Lauren Hardy stayed here. Marlena Dietrich, Judy Garland stayed here. Roy Rogers and Trigger. I've got the photograph taken on the stairs inside of here as well. Uh, Nelson Mandela stayed here. Uh, the Dalai Lama has stayed here. So lots of famous people have stayed here. Have a look at the architecture as well. I think it's wonderful. Early 1900s. The train station that it was built upon is now closed and actually the main concourse in, uh, of the train station is now part of their uh, restaurant and cocktail bar and breakfast room. It's a great place to stay in. I'd highly recommend it. Right on the end of Prince Street. So one end of Prince Street we have the Caledonian Hotel. People here always refer to it as the Cali or the Caledonian. Very few people refer to it as the Waldorf Astoria. The name just sticks with us. And on the other side of Prince Street we have what used to be known as the North British is now known as the Balmoral. Now we've talked about famous characters in the cemetery here, but I want to introduce you to another little famous character here in Edinburgh. Now he's a little cartoon character that appears in one of our newspapers every Sunday and his name is Wally. That's Wally, not Willy, but Wally. W-U-L-L-I-E. He is one of our national cartoon characters. And look, he's done up like Braveheart here. You might want to Google Ur Wally. Ur Wally, which means our William, if you were speaking in proper English. Uh, about a year ago, there was a competition and different Willies, uh, Wallies, were painted in different styles. So you'll see the little statues all over the country, all painted differently and it's to raise money for a charity and it was very successful. And right next to it, prior to that, we had another competition with our cow. So you'll see the cows all over the country as well, all painted for charity. And if you're looking for a really good steak restaurant, there's a restaurant just there called Kylo. Kylo is the old name for the beef cattle here in Scotland. I would highly recommend it. They bring out all the cuts for you to choose. And it's a great little restaurant. Across the street, again, Scotland, known for its beef, also known for its whiskey. And I'm sure you all know Johnny Walker. I'll just give it a minute for this ambulance to pass. There we go. Here we have, again, right on Princess Street, this used to be a department store here. Uh, it was very famous. It, I grew up knowing it as Bins, but then it became part of the House of Fraser. Now it's been taken over by the Johnny Walker Whiskey Company, and it's going to be converted into the Johnny Walker Experience. So when you come here to Edinburgh, you can stay in the Caledonian, walk at the Caledonian, have a really lovely steak at the Kylo Restaurant and Grill, and go across the road and have your whiskey as well. So let's walk across the street here. We're going to take a walk along Princess Street. I don't know if you can see in the diff distance here, but there's a good view here down the street and you can actually see at the very end the National Monument of Scotland, which we've talked about before, but also the great view of the two churches here through to Edinburgh Castle. It actually reminds me of a little joke. I don't know if it will translate very well, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, 
So this Scotsman gets shipwrecked and he ends up in a desert island, kind of like Robinson Crusoe. And he's there for about 30 years. And being Scottish and being inventive and using his initiative, he starts to build. And he builds furiously. He builds himself a nice house and he starts building other buildings. Then about 30 years after he's been shipwrecked, this other ship goes past. He builds a big fire and the captain of the ship sees the smoke. So he sends out little tenders to go and find out what's happening on this desert island and he's there. The captain's there with his captain's mates. They all come ashore and there's a little Scotsman there and he's very proud of himself. And the captain says, my, you've been a really busy guy. He said, yeah. He said, look, at, he said, have you built yourself a house? He went, yes, indeed I've built myself a house. He goes, look at those two buildings up on the hill there. He goes, well, that's my church, that's the churches. He said, well, why did you build two churches? He said, well, that's a church that I go to and that's a church that I don't go to. If you're Scottish, you'll get that, I hope. <laughs> so let's cross across, go across Princess Street. And then we're going to take you on one of the, another famous streets called Rose Street. We've got the green man here. We're having little showers at the moment, so I will take this umbrella down in a second. In fact, I think I'll take it in now. Hiya, now, Rose Street runs parallel with Princess Street, and Rose Street is famous for a few different reasons. If you go and visit, if you come into Edinburgh to the rugby, there is a tradition either before or after the rugby you try and visit as many pubs as you can Rose Street has got about I would say over 20 to 25 pubs there's also tradition on the first year at university to get one of your mates together and you have a three-legged pub crawl so you tie your legs together and you go from bar to bar to bar have a drink and see how far you can get down the street I don't know if it's been fulfilled so much this year, but certainly when I was a student at university, we never got very far along the street, I can tell you. So let's move on a little bit. We've got off the main street, a little bit noisy here. We've got the trams, the buses, and McDonald's. <laughs> well, McDonald's, a famous Scottish name. Famous Scottish clan. And we've got the Campbells too. We will tell the story about the Campbells and the McDonald's later on. Suffice to say that if you're ever invited to a wedding involving Campbells and McDonald's, don't go. <laughs> it usually ends up in a fight. And that's for historic reasons, but we will explain that. It's all to do with the massacre of Glencoe, which we will talk about later on, no doubt. But let's take a walk up here onto Rose Street. And then we'll do a handover and Mike will guide you through Rose Street itself. Now, if you do remember when we were doing Charlotte Square, we showed, we walked past the house that Ale Alexander Graham Bell was born in. We're going to walk past it again. So, I would like to say again, thank you for 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 supporting us in this. We, I mean, it's a great endeavour. We love doing it. We are going to be doing a little bit, some things a little bit different. So, we really recommend or request that you come and visit us on YouTube because we're going to be doing little 10 minute shorts. They're called Hidden Corners. Some of you have seen them before. But we are going to be asking some other guest speakers to come and join us. And uh, we've had great feedback from some of our other Blue Badge guides who want to join us on this. So we're going to try it and we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the individual characters that you may, know, may have heard of somewhere bubbling under the radar in terms of Scottish history and but we're going to pick them every week we're going to pick somebody different and we're going to try and have a different speaker so I would highly recommend you come and visit us on our YouTube channel and also visit us on our own individual website so Piping Scott Tours for Mike Scotland with Joe for me for Joe and we're going to do a little handover but before that again just sh show you here we're outside Alexander Graham Bell's house here. Inventor of the telephone, born here in Edinburgh, 
1847. So I'm going to say a big thank you again. I'm going to take off my mic. We're going to do a handover. I give my mic to Mike. And I look forward to seeing you very shortly.